Morning. Welcome. It's nice of you all to come. Uh, and for those of you that may just arrive, we've had uh, some excitement this morning. We had um, Anne Marie Slaughter from the Department of State and Don Steinberg from USAID um, kick us off this morning by introducing the QDDR. Uh, for those of you that have been reading the papers and following this at long last, mm -hmm. that document has finally emerged. Um, I think it's altogether sort of fitting and proper for um, the rollout of that document to begin here. If you remember at our last meeting of the USIP Security Sector Reform Working Group, we had Karen Hanrahan, who is the Executive Secretary of the QDDR process here to describe the process for us. And today we had her boss uh, here to talk about the document itself. Um, we're also rather excited with the announcement uh, made by our Executive Vice President this morning um, that the um, USSR initiative on security sector governance has now become a center uh, here at the Institute, and that's a step up that we've been working on for a long time. Um, <clears throat> today, we will look at the unique role which the European Union has played in security sector reform. The EU conducted extensive SSR programs in preparing 21 countries for accession to EU membership. The EU has also engaged in security sector transformation and peace and stability operations in Bosnia, Kosovo, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. In these very different environments, the EU reformed defense and interior ministries and trained operational police and military forces. The EU accumulated in the process a very thick portfolio of experiences, lessons learned, and best practices. The first question we're going to address this morning is, does the European Union, by virtue of its experiences, its historic, linguistic, and cultural affinity with many countries, and its large pool of experienced and skilled personnel, have a comparative advantage over the United States in reforming security sector institutions and training security forces? in crisis states and in post-conflict environments. This question arises because although the United States has provided security assistance to a broad range of partner countries and engaged in extensive um, SSR programs in Iraq and Afghanistan, its efforts have produced mixed results. Certainly, the European Union has real advantages in conducting SSR programs in the form of its parallel institutions, its cultural affinities, and its personnel skills when you compare it to the United States. The United States, for example, has no national police force. Our Department of the Interior is responsible for national parks, not internal security. Our Justice Department does not run the court system, which is in another branch of government under the constitutional separation of powers. Now, this is not to suggest that the United States should abandon SSR to the Europeans, but it does, however, raise a second question, and that is, what do we have to learn from the European Union in this area? To address these questions, we have a new USIP special report on the EU experience with security sector governance, which is on the table outside. I had a copy, but I gave it away to uh, um, Anne-Marie Slaughter. I don't, for those of you that were there, she said she couldn't bridge these two, but she immediately engaged in a real argument with Hans, you know, defending the European Union, and uh, so she's really quite expert about this, and she took the paper and she said she was going to read it on um, on the train going back up to Princeton. Anyway, so we have a brand new special report on this topic. We have the report's author, Alex Berg, with us this morning. You have the bios on the panelists, and I will introduce them in the order in which we will speak. Alex Berg is a Jennings Randolph Peace Scholar at the United States Institute of Peace. Hans Hubeck is a senior researcher in the Central African Program at the Egmont Royal Institute for International Relations in Brussels. And Eva Gross is a senior research fellow at the Institute for European Studies at the Free University in Brussels and a visiting scholar at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. So we have a very distinguished panel. We also have a bunch of people in the audience who know a lot about this topic as well. So we'll start, and then we'll open the floor for questions when the panelists have finished. Thanks very much. Alex. <coughs> well, 
thank you uh, all very much for coming and for, for staying after this morning's interesting presentation. And thank you to the U.S. Institute of Peace for organizing the session, for the opportunity to speak um, today. And uh, the, the remarks I'm going to make are based on the paper that Bob just mentioned that I, I recently drafted um, and on looking at EU experience with a certain aspect of um, security sector reform and governance. Uh, the paper is based partly over research I conducted over the last year in a number of, of post-conflict and stabilization contexts with an emphasis on looking at the political and governance aspects of, of security sector reform and what the role of foreign um, assistance is. Um, and for this paper, I looked, I, I looked at the EU and other actors in my research. For this paper, I looked specifically at um, EU institutions and, and how they're set up and how they've managed some of these challenge, some of these challenges. The paper actually focuses on one very specific aspect of governance, which is oversight ministries, but um, some of the lessons, I think, are, are applicable more broadly. So the, the EU, and one of the things I looked at, the EU actually has some real rich advantages, as, as Bob mentioned, the diversity of countries, of traditions, of legal cultures, of languages, of experiences that can, that can serve as a model um, for countries embarking on their own reforms. Uh, it has unique relationships with different countries. But the diversity also and, and the number of countries also creates a lot of challenges. Um, and how they've managed those is, is something I'm going to explore a little bit. So what I want to do is um, first just give a very brief kind of overview of what institutions we're talking about um, and then go through some of these, some of these challenges. Um, so just to make sure we're on the same page, the EU is a very complex set of countries and institutions. There are, there are 27 member states. There are a whole number of institutions and agencies. Um, when we talk about their role in security sector reform and in assistance overseas, we're talking about two main institutions, so just to be clear on what they are. The first one is the European Council. Um, the Council is actually the, the main um, decision-making body of, of the European Union. It's made up of the heads of states, of the member states. It has a rotating um, presidency. Um, and it's a political body made up of, of um, political heads of states. But the Council also has a secretariat and is responsible for one of the three pillars of, of the EU, which is the Common uh, Foreign and Security Policy, which includes what's known as the Common Security and Defense Policy, or the CSDP, which I'll refer to a bunch of times. The CSDP is basically the EU's capacity to respond to crisis environments. So since uh, 2003, I believe, was the first mission in Bosnia. They fielded about 22 different missions that include both military and civilian personnel from the EU member states, with a real focus on the civilian side, establishing rule of law, reforming uh, security sector institutions um, through seconded personnel that have advised and, and mentored personnel. Um, the, the other main institution is the European Commission, which is, which is the EU's main um, executive body, basically. It manages policy and regulation um, and programs, including the EU's development activities around the world. So it has a broad portfolio of institution building and development programs around the world, including uh, a specific um, mandate to do security sector reform activities with a focus primarily on the governance aspects. So oversight ministries, legislative oversight, working with civil society, justice sector reform, and so forth. So, so that's more kind of the long-term institution building development side, whereas the CSTP is more the crisis response side. But of course, in many countries, they both operate. Um, there, of course, are a number of other institutions, the European Parliament being kind of the, the main one, but I'm going to focus on those two. Um, the other thing I should mention, um, which hopefully my co-panelists will go into a bit more, is the Lisbon Treaty, which makes a number of changes to the way these institutions are organized. I'm not going to mention them too much, but hopefully we'll, we'll hear about some of that. The other aspect of the EU that, that I'm going to touch on quite a bit is the EU enlargement process. Um, and this is, I think, a very instructive uh, experience particularly with respect to security sector reform. Um, as you know, the EU grew from initial about six members to current 27 in successive waves, the biggest wave of which came in 2004 and 2007 when 12 countries of Eastern and Central Europe uh, joined. And, and the process entailed some, some major institutional transformations, including in the security sector. The countries had to conform to the acquis communautaire, which is a set of rules and regulations by the EU. And the EU member states had some particular interest in the security sector, which is that they wanted to make sure these new states could control the expanded borders and could cooperate on, on law enforcement and security issues, especially in the wake of 9-11. So there were, there were major reorganizations to the forces, to their roles and responsibilities, to oversight ministries, to the way personnel were recruited um, and, and selected. All of the aspects that we talk about in terms of security reform, sector reform in, in a pretty comprehensive way. 
And this process was managed primarily by the European Commission, which both managed the negotiation and provided assistance. Um, so there's there's a lot to learn. Um, the, the kind of transformation is, is, is pretty um, unparalleled anywhere else, except maybe by the transformation in the defense sectors. This was mostly on the, on the civilian law enforcement and border side. At the same time, the defense sectors were being transformed in the same country through the NATO accession process. So um, I think there are a lot of lessons here, both what they did well and some of the challenges. And, and some of these are actually applicable to other contexts like post-conflict and stabilization. I don't want to overstate the parallels because there's some very unique features of the EU, EU enlargement process, particularly the carrot of EU reform, which created a huge incentive, and also the level of capacity in the countries. But some of the same basic issues um, they're still struggling with. So what, I, what I'm going to do is highlight about four of these challenges. Um, which, which I see as kind of fundamental challenge to um, addressing security sector governance issues, uh, and um, talk about what the EU has um, has done, what the how the enlargement process worked, and what how they've been trying to deal with them in, in post-conflict and stabilization contexts. And hopefully, my colleagues will actually talk a little bit more about how these have played out on the ground. So there, the. The, the four kind of um, challenges that I look at. The first one is, is defining a clear structure um, and vision for the security sector, for the sector as a whole, or for the particular institution that you're trying to deal with. Um, th this is one of the main lessons from the EU enlargement process. The EU had a set of requirements and benchmarks that they had to meet, um, but each country was left up, was left to design its own structure, um, a division of roles, what sets of authority. And so what you had was a, was a, a structure that was developed and owned by the officials in the country and with the EU sort of monitoring and, and providing benchmarks for moving forward with it. And one of the clear lessons was that assistance provided by the EC was much more effective once those kinds of basic issues were defined um, than before. And so then you could develop the appropriate policies and training, but before you did that, it, it, it didn't have as much impact. And in post-conflict countries, this is, this is a major issue. Um, the level of capacity, lack of experience in, in doing this kind of work, competing political interests. But donors t um, will come in anyway, um, analyze what they think the problems are, what their visions are for reform, um, and those might often compete with local priorities and create a whole host of problems. Um, and, and the EU, for you know, one example, and maybe perhaps uh, uh, Eva Gross will talk a bit about this, in, is in Afghanistan, where the EU and the US had very different visions for what the police force should look like whether it should be counterinsurgency or more civilian community-oriented policing. And that really delayed the whole process of building up a police force for, for a long time. Um, in the absence of a clear model, advisors will come in, and without sort of a clear structure, they'll fall back on whatever um, experience they had from their countries. Um, so in Kosovo, for example, you had different officers from different countries um, providing conflict, conflicting advice. Everything had to construct, conduct patrols and, and write up a crime scene report to you know, how much oversight the, ministry, the minister should have over the forces, um, and introducing different laws, different databases, which has created a, a whole host of problems. And it really undermines the credibility of all the assistance that's provided when you get that kind of situation. So what are some of the things that have been done? Um, the EU has actually experimented in, in interesting ways. One is to try to get a, a clear sense of in the mandate before you go in. The CSDP missions negotiate a, um, a, a mandate with the host country generally. And so there's some ideas of trying to get a clear structure within that, or at least a, some benchmarks or process for achieving it um, as the, the mission deploys. Another is to, is to support strategic planning processes as part of the mission. Um, the EU is involved in this in Afghanistan, for example. Um, and, and I think it's been helpful in terms of getting everybody on the same page you know, within the ministries, within the police, and so forth. So those are just a couple of things to um, deal with that. The second area I want to highlight, um, which is a big one, is uh, finding and deploying the right personnel. And uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, I think, uh, raised this issue in terms of bolstering U.S. civilian um, capacity. Um, the U.S. has gotten gradually better at, at getting people, but as Bob mentioned, the U.S. has some major challenges. Our law enforcement forces are decentralized. We don't have national level ministries. Um, we've gotten better at getting police officers out, but there have been some real gaps, especially on the law enforcement side, in the civilian administration, management, policy issues that are really critical to the governance aspects. The EU, on the other hand, has 27 states with many different ministries, different structures, um, languages that may be more or less relevant to the, to the countries they're, they're operating in, a wealth of experience to tap into. 
Um, but there are a few lessons, I think, additional to that from the EU enlargement experience that are worth highlighting. One is that the, you know, getting the right skills is important, but it's, just not, it's not just the, the technical skills. Experts need to know how to mentor and advise and train. They need to understand the context. So preparation and training beforehand is, is important. Another one is that they need to be there for a sufficient amount of time. Um, there are many examples of um, people rotating in for six months. By the time they get up to speed on what's, what's happening in the country, it's time to leave, and the next person has to start over. Um, so a lot of the evaluations suggest at least a year and preferably more than two years for, for people working in those contexts. Um, and then a, a third lesson is, is the ability to facilitate longer-term relationships between individuals and institutions. An interesting experience in the EU enlargement was the twinning program where the, the European Commission funded the partnerships between institutions and like training academies, ministries, in member states with those in candidate countries, and they sent kind of series of advisors. And when, when those worked well, you could get these sort of longer-term relationships for, forming, or after they went home, they could pick up the phone and, and get continuing advice. So having officials to work with rather than sort of just only private contractors can, can make a big difference. Um, now, how, So how are these lessons applied in, in other kinds of contexts? Well, the Commission has actually tried to do this, this sort of model in contracting directly with institutions um, outside of candidate countries in, in a few cases. And that's actually something the U.S. might explore in our relationships with state and local governments, for example. Um, it's an interesting model. Um, another is the CSDP missions, which have spent most of their effort on um, building capacity to recruit the right kinds of personnel. Um, so they've done the, the Council Secretariat, which is managing these things, um, they've developed what's called the civilian headline goals and spent a lot of time analyzing missions, developing scenarios, identifying the right skills for different kinds of missions, actually writing up job descriptions, having them in their database so that then as soon as there's a mission, they can go out and get these people quickly. Um, they've also just started to develop some training programs, although that, that's, that's still in its infancy, I think. Um, but of course, it's still been a challenge to get people. The, the challenge with the EU is that they have to rely on the member states to actually bring these people. Some member states have really well organized to, to do this. Some are still having trouble. Um, and there's just a limited supply of experts. The best people are valued by their own institutions who don't want to get let up. People don't want to serve in insecure environments and so forth. So the EU has really been exploring how to work with member states to overcome these problems. And that's something, again, that we could look to in, in, in terms of how we do this. Um, the U.S. has, I think, advanced in this area. The Def Department of Defense has been mo mobilizing civilians through the MOTA program, um, but we could, I think we could learn a little bit from, from some of that. So the third area um, that I want to highlight is what I call managing um, political obstacles or managing organizational change. If you have the best people, um, the right mandate, you're, especially in post-conflict environments, um, security sector reform, as we know, is a highly political process. It's highly contested. Um, you're you're um, dealing with with power relationships and that that could be jeopardized, and so there are always political obstacles in any process of reform, especially this one. Um, the EU enlargement experience was kind of unique in that you had this amazing carrot of EU membership, um, but it wasn't just having that carrot; it was how they managed it, and I think there's some interesting lessons there as well. Um, one is that they had very clear benchmarks. There were annual plans. Um, there was ongoing monitoring. That helped keep focus not only on the overall principles but really specific issues. Um, and when there were problems, the, the commission kind of functioned as this focal point that would raise issues, raise, it, raise them to the council and the member states, and then they could get involved on the di diplomatic level to follow up and make sure these things were happening. Really this linkage between the technical level and the political level that underlied, I think, what, what was talked about this morning in terms of the QDDR, which has been a, a major gap in a lot of these programs. Um, but even without the care of EU membership, there are ways to use some of these same principles. If you have a peace agreement or a constitution, or better yet, a strategic plan, you can use that in, in terms of developing specific benchmarks. Um, the CSDP, by having people uh, on the ground monitoring, um, the head of mission can actually play that role, work directly with, me with, uh, with counterpart ministers, raise issues um, to, the, to the political level with, with member states. Um, but another approach to doing this, which it, the EU did not focus on as much in the enlargement process, which was really a top-down, is to look at the broader constituencies in a country for these kinds of reforms. Um, the Commission does work with civil society, with legislators, um, with, with political parties, and especially when there isn't that kind of top-down pressure, that political support is, is often crucial to, to get things done. But we often don't 
um, you know, much like our, our programs here where USAID might engage with these groups and DOD or the State Department is doing the technical stuff, those linkages aren't there. Um, if they were, that could actually help move these things forward over time and, and enhance sustainability. Of course, that requires coordination, and that's the, the last point that I, that I want to highlight. Um, dealing with the political obstacles, the technical obstacles, requires a high amount of coordination, um, and this has been actually really a real challenge for the EU. Um, one, between the various member states, um, when they're on the same page, things work, work really well. An uh, example that is often highlighted is, is Georgia, where you had a really unified EU. There were some problems at the technical level in terms of getting through some of the reforms, and they were able to work through those. Um, Kosovo is probably the opposite end of the extreme, where not all the member states agree on the, on the sovereignty of Kosovo, and that's really created all kinds of problems for the mission in being able to engage with different institutions. Um, and even when you have the member states agreeing, you've had major issues between the, the commission, sort of long-term development approach, and the, the CSDP crisis response missions. Um, where, where it works really well, the, the, um, the advisors can highlight issues, raise them for the commission. The commission can design long-term programs to deal with them. Um, and that's actually been very complementary. In other places, like the Democratic Republic of Congo, you had two different programs with separate reporting structures not talking to each other at all, which, which was a major problem. Um, so, and, and then, of course, even with, if the EU is, is in the same, on the same page, you've got other donors, um, as I mentioned, issues in Afghanistan and Kosovo and other places. So there are ways to deal with this, of course. Um, one is to really address this issue of, of coordination and cohesion between longer and shorter term approaches. Um, we heard about some of that this morning. Um, and another is, is, is collaboration between different donors, the U.S. and the EU in, in this case, um, joint assessments, combined benchmarks, combined evaluation and indicators, steering committees bringing different groups. There, there are lots of ideas out there which unfortunately take a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of preparation, and those are the kinds of things that I think could be explored. Um, the one just, the last point that I'll just mention quickly is that the EU enlargement process was embedded in this much broader um, administrative reforms, the reforms to the civil service, to how you hire and recruit people. And that made a huge difference in terms of the ability to do things in the security sector. That's a major issue for um, post-conflict states. And so looking at these really broader issues of civil service reform and salaries and pay scales, um, those are kinds of discussions that, that need to happen as well. So I'm, I'm going to sort of leave it at that. I've highlighted, um, I think, four areas. Uh, um, in terms of de defining a clear structure, mobilizing the right personnel, managing political obstacles and donor coordination, um, and hopefully some of my colleagues will address how some of these things have played out in practice. And I'll just leave with, with two sort of final points that I think summarize this. One is that in, in terms of approaching this, the U.S. does need to focus more on the governance and political aspects and, and how to manage these things. And there are some really interesting lessons from the EU in at both the enlargement and, and crisis context in terms of how they've done that well or not so well. And the second one is there are a, a ton of opportunities for cooperation that would really have a big impact on the ground. And hopefully we can talk about some of those. So I will leave the rest to my colleagues. Yeah. Thanks very much. Hans, you're up. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Um, the EU and SSR. Um, it's a very interesting topic, and it got me thinking as well because I'm mainly working on, on African issues. My, my daily research is, let's say, on, on the Great Lakes region uh, and specifically on uh, security sector reform in, in the DRC, where the European Union is a, is a strong actor. But I look at it from a geographical perspective and not really let's say, as, in, uh, as an institutional analyst on what the EU is doing or how the EU is doing uh, things. So it got me thinking these last uh, two, two weeks, three weeks since I was invited. Um, and um, I think that some of the things I will say are, are probably uh, a little bit uh, provocative. Um, and I must also warn you that I'm not necessarily an optimist. Um, but working for 10, 15 years on Central Africa does not really uh, induce a lot of optimism in the capacities of the international community, let alone the European Union in getting its act together in uh, post-conflict reconstruction and in security sector reform in, in, in particular. Now, as was asked, I will start with a few broader comments on, on the European Union. 
Um, again, I'm not an expert on the European Union as, European Union as such, but living in Brussels um, within and between uh, EU officials uh, almost on a daily basis, of course, you, you, you hear and see a lot of stuff. Uh, and WikiLeaks should probably try to find someone in the EU to, to put some interesting stuff on the, on the net. It, it could, could, could create some interesting uh, debate uh, as well. Um, I think a lot of what, what Alex said uh, describes quite well the challenges and issues of the EU pre-Lisbon. Um, Post-Lisbon, um, and specifically again for this exercise, I m met a lot of people. I talked to a number of diplomats also uh, last week. What is going to happen? Well, nobody knows. Um, it is one big unclarity, especially the setup of the European External Action Service. Uh, it should be at the heart of what the EU is going to do as an external actor. Um, it should take the lead and it should overcome the issues of, or at least to a large degree, of coordination and coherence um, between Commission and Council. Um, but so far, nobody really knows what is going to happen. People are still taking their offices, moving into new uh, offices, moving into new structures. And the European External Action Service itself is still finding its place within the institutions of the EU and also amongst the member states. One of the big questions here and one of the big uncertainties is, is the External Action Service going to become the first Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the European Union, or will it just be the 28th? Uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the EU. So far, uh, indications uh, and frustrations of a lot of people working in, in Brussels point to the latter. The External Election Service is not going to be the premier player of the EU um, or of Europe, let's say, in uh, peace and security uh, issues. Um, this position remaining very clearly with a few key uh, member states, which brings me to the missions. There's one clear thing you can say about any mission, be it civilian or military, that the European Union uh, engages, engages itself into. Um, you need alignment between at least three countries. The rest can join, but you need alignment between Fran the Fran French, the UK, and Germany. If these three do not agree on the need to have a mission, there is no debate. There's not going to be discussion. So that's how decision-making within the EU currently functions. And this is also why a number of missions are being undertaken or why a number of missions are not going to be undertaken. So be it civilian or, or military missions, um, and, and the External Action Service is not going to be able to overcome this uh, issue, of course. It's going to be very well embedded in this uh, foreign policy by France, the UK, and uh, Germany. Now, if there's one structural thing you can say about um, EU engagement in, in crisis uh, or post-conflict uh, intervention. I think you have to make a distinction in the way between Kosovo and the rest of the world. Kosovo being geographically in Europe, in future probably going to become a part of the EU, at least that is one of the big carrots that is always presented to, to, to Kosovo and to the, to the entire region. So Kosovo is a specific issue, is a specific um, interest for the European Union to deal in. But in other areas, the EU has one um, common uh, element, that is, it is um, very risk averse. Um, we do not want to take risks. Um, we have very short missions with uh, mission statements that are relatively uh, unspec unspecified or very specified to avoid uh, any uh, specific risk, and everything is very much oriented towards uh, a feasible exit strategy. Um, which in a way is understandable. We have a very young institution which is still trying to build its legitimacy, so you cannot have failures. Um, look at our military missions, for example, in the DRC, the mission in, 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 in uh, Ituri in 2003 was very short, about three months, a very clear, very exact mandate. It was a very important mission. I think it has been criticized uh, a lot for unjust uh, reasons, but it was a very uh, low risk uh, mission um, as such. And the same is for the, the other missions in, in Congo that, that followed, also for the civilian uh, missions as such. But I'll talk a bit more on the Congo uh, later. Um, the member states, and I want to go into a number of, um, of, 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 of elements that Alex uh, mentioned, uh, not necessarily in, in, in a chronological order, but um, yes, we have diverse uh, experiences. Yes, we have a very rich 
um, cultural, uh, organizational, structural, legal, whatever, framework of the different EU countries that can be an advantage in, in, in security sector reform. Um, but I would not overestimate that either. Um, um, it is very difficult to send policemen, for example. Um, everybody wants to keep the policemen at home. If you go to the Minister of the Interior in any EU country, they will say, well, you know, we have this insecurity. Why should we send uh, policemen to Afghanistan? Why should we send them to Congo or what have you? So the, these engagements are always relatively short term, and there is very little um, uh, there are very little incentives for um, governments and, and ministers of the interior, let's say, to, to, to deal in this. The same goes with the um, justice sector. Um, all our justice or legal systems are under strain. It is very hard to find countries that are willing to send uh, uh, acting uh, judges and experts to, um, to other countries. Again, Kosovo given the scale and given the political importance is, is, is a bit of a difference. I would also, on, 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 the, on the issue of police, perhaps one caveat, uh, those countries that have a gendarmerie force, like Italy, like France, like the Netherlands, uh, Spain, paramilitary units, it's easier to send them out. They are constituted as uh, orga organizations that go to, uh, um, that can be deployed and they have a deployable uh, vocation as, as such. But then you come again with a conceptual issue and a conceptual problem. There is no conceptual uni union in, in the EU on what to do with police reform um, in post-conflict uh, countries. Um, looking at Congo, looking at Burundi, um, a number of EU countries are proposing uh, community policing, whereas a number of other countries are doing crowd control and what have you. And sometimes these, uh, these conflicts run right through uh, EU uh, police missions, as is very much the case in the EU mission uh, in, in the DRC, where Belgium, for instance, was very much in favor of community policing, and the French were very much engaged and actually did quite a lot of training, bilaterally that is, uh, of uh, Congolese uh, crowd control uh, units, together with the Angolans, uh, for that matter. Um, so... Yes, there is a very rich experience. There is a very rich uh, field of activity of EU countries and of EU institutions as such. Um, but uh, there is very little coherence. There is very, also very little um, incentive to get more coherence, um, at least in the short and medium uh, term. Now, looking a bit more to, uh, to Africa, um, which is in a way you could say a, a, laboratory, a laboratory for the EU's uh, external action uh, service, um, and especially the DRC, um, where the EU got increasingly en engaged uh, since 2000, um, when you saw the first shifts, let's say, in the, in the conflict. Um, the EU was the main supportive structure for the transition uh, government. Uh, it's spent since 2003 about a billion uh, euros in, uh, in the DRC, and it has deployed uh, two military missions, Artemis, that I already mentioned in 2003, and uh, U4 Kinshasa in uh, 2006. And I would say that given the EU's involvement in security sector reform, there has been one moment where you saw an interesting coordination and coherence in the EU's action in the field. And that was exactly at the start of the Congolese transition when the European Commission uh, trained a thousand strong police unit uh, in Kinshasa. Um, following that mission, uh, the Council sent the uh, initial uh, UPOL uh, mission, that was an advisory mission and a follow-up mission for the trained uh, unit by the, uh, by the Commission. Um, but following the, the end of the transition period, this uh, police unit was immediately disbanded by the new Congolese government, and the police mission for a, for, a, for a year, year and a half, was basically left without a concrete mission as such. It developed slowly into a strategic advisory mission on uh, police uh, reform. And actually it's doing relatively well, uh, relatively in the shade, but also for functioning with the only uh, Congolese institution in the security sector that seems to get some, some progress. And I say some progress with the, you should say some, and uh, uh, <laughs> that is the important thing here. Um, now, um, in almost the same period, in 2005, so when the police mission uh, was deployed, 
the EU broadened uh, its engagement and sent the USEC uh, mission, which is a mission composed by military officers, but it is a civilian mission uh, as such, as a strategic advisory mission on security sector reform for the Congolese uh, army. Now, USEC took a lot of time, several months, to put itself in place. Once it was in place, the transition in Congo was over, and you had a completely different relationship between uh, the international community and especially the European Union and this Congolese government. This Congolese government at that point did no longer want or did, was not longer interested in having strategic advice or foreigners telling them what to do with the security uh, sector, which from 2006 to today is one of the main causes of uh, why you do not get any form of uh, progress in uh, security sector reform in Congo. They do not want the UN, but they certainly do not want the EU. So this mission has been looking for an identity since, and it has found uh, some cause or some goals in working on a number of technical issues, which are important, but which uh, and which had some, let's say, strategic value, but which have um, which remain very fragile, um, and where you have no strategic willingness of the Congolese government to go through with these uh, with these uh, changes. The most important of which is the setting up of a chain of payment system and a kind of an identification system for Congolese uh, soldiers. Basically, after the transition, there were about 300,000 Congolese troops, of which about 150,000 existed uh, in reality and of which about 25,000 received actual salary. The rest of this huge mass of salary that left the National Bank uh, every uh, month uh, was uh, kept in the pockets of the uh, high command of the Congolese armed groups and armed uh, forces. Um, so dealing with this huge problem of corruption, which is also one of the reasons why this army is looting and, and pillaging uh, parts of the country where it is deployed, is an important mission. Uh, it has been stated as a success so far. People on the ground uh, tend to see it differently. Uh, you have identification, yes. Uh, you have the setting up of a chain of payment system, yes, in a number of, in a number of areas it is. But the implementation as such on a daily or monthly basis remains incredibly weak. Again, the problem of commitment. And that brings me to, let's say, an overarching thing. Yes, you have uh, technical involvement daily through UPOL, through uh, USEC, in security sector reform in Congo. And a relatively important financial investment in the field of development uh, by the European Commission. But you have little to no political clout associated with this. The EU is not capable of acting as one political voice in Congo in dealing with this Congolese government. Um, so yes, you have a number of advantages in setting up this kind of missions, and yes, you have a number of countries that can bring expertise, experience uh, that is well uh, defined for the Congo, but you do not have a political face of the European Union uh, uh, that can uh, hammer down the message. Um, one of the reasons for this is, okay, the attitude of the Congolese government. I mean, it's not easy for the UN to get a dialogue with this government going. Um, but it is also the EU member states themselves who make it complicated. Um, it is very clear for the Congolese government that Belgium, France, uh, the UK, uh, and a number of other countries are not on the same line in what they want to do in the Congo, have their own political process, and those political processes, those bilateral processes, weigh much more than what the EU can bring to the table. So EU countries, in a way, are undercutting um, the EU's collective uh, role in, in, in this country. And it is not only in Congo that you see this, uh, that you see this problem. So uh, you still have, and you will continue to have, uh, Ashton and her servers are not going to change this. You will continue to have uh, this kind of uh, quabbling and this kind of lack of unity uh, in uh, the EU's external uh, actions. Um, yeah, we could perhaps in, in Q&A talk a bit more on Congo and, and those issues. Um, but there are a few other missions that I just want to mention that are also quite relevant and quite interesting, um, and that also underscore the risk averseness, uh, averseness of the European Union. Uh, the mission in Guinea-Bissau, for example, um, which was launched uh, in 2008, if I'm not mistaken, um, got more or less operational in the course of 2009, but when political crisis struck uh, Guinea-Bissau, which was hardly uh, a big surprise, 
the EU immediately uh, cut, it, cut its losses and left the country. Uh, the mandate was cut short, and the uh, last EU official left Guinea-Bissau in uh, uh, September of this year. Um, much to the dismay in private of the UN, who is now taking over this whole uh, SSR agenda, but we have an EU that committed itself, that did write uh, some uh, legislation for the Guinea-Bissau security services, but as such uh, did not have the staying power to, to do something real in, uh, in, in Guinea-Bissau. Um, but of course, if you look at EU official documents, you will see that uh, the Guinea-Bissau mission was, as all ES, uh, EU foreign missions, uh, a huge uh, success, uh, again, because we wrote this uh, legislation. Um, and then there is Somalia with the EU training mission for uh, Somali troops for the transitional government, um, which is um, an important mission, um, much more important than the uh, Atalanta mission, uh, the, the fighting piracy for the coast of, uh, of Somalia. This is actually trying to, 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 to give this transitional government that we all say to, to support some means uh, to, um, to, to, to exist. But sadly, um, this mission is we, we, we train, so far we trained about 2,000 Somali uh, troops uh, in Uganda, uh, using mainly Ugandan trainers uh, supported by the EU. Um, but the troops that leave this camp end up in Mogadishu without any kind of support structure whatsoever. So a large par part of those have already found their way to Al-Shabaab, where they have payments, where they have a structure, and where they... Um, have um, a future, which is not the case of this transitional government. Again, the mission itself is seen as a success, but it is, for the moment, rather counterproductive to train uh, those troops that the uh, AU uh, peace mission is uh, currently fighting in, in Mogadishu. Um, again, this is not a strictly SSR mission. This is mainly capacity building uh, of, of a government in, in need of troops. But um, there was a recent Chatham House conference where you can read the, the report is online. It's, it's of, uh, about a month ago, um, where some su suggestions were made and that uh, the EU should put in place an antenna in uh, Mogadishu to uh, to uh, take care of the second batch of troops that are going to be trained or that they are planned to be trained in the coming in the coming months. So let's say these are a few comments that I wanted to make, mainly focusing on, on Africa. And I'm looking forward to the debate. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. And now, Eva? Can I stay seated? Do you mind? Or? Um, it's up to you. Sure. It's up uh, to you. It's easier, it's easier for the ah, camera okay. to see right, you if, you're, if you speak from the podium. To the yes, I know. It's, uh, it's wonderful. It's our chance to be a star. <laughs> okay. No, it's just that it's scribbled ac across, you know, five different notebooks. So ah, no. okay. <laughs> Anyways, well. well, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I've spent the past uh, semester here in Washington over at SAIS, and I've attended quite a few of your meetings here, including the last uh, report on security sector reform. So it's kind of a pleasure to be able to contribute something uh, to the debates uh, myself. Um, my work normally focuses on EU crisis management and the common security and defense policy, including the sort of internal machinery of the EU. And I've been looking in terms of the mission specifically on UPOL Afghanistan, which I followed pretty much from the moment of its inception and creation, have visited several times uh, to actually see uh, how it's going. So I've been asked to uh, make some comments on, on how the EU and what the EU is doing in in Afghanistan. Um, so this, this is what I'm hoping to do in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And I would like to suggest that uh, when we evaluate, I'm going to sidestep the success or failure issue. I don't think that's uh, <laughs> the most um, perhaps helpful um, terminology. But if we, for an evaluation of an EU mission, any type of mission, whether that's in Afghanistan or elsewhere, I think there are three lenses we can employed to, to do that. Uh, one is the internal EU setup, the coherence, coordination, uh, running uh, of, of the deployment and implementation of the mission. Um, the second is how the EU interacts with partners in the field. And in Afghanistan, obviously, that's the United States, most of all, uh, and NATO second. And actually, Alex, when you were um, mentioning enlargement and the EU's impact of security on security sector reform, there I was sort of reminded that you know, don't forget the role of NATO in that as well. I mean, there was a real sort of lockstep where these uh, now member states first started as NATO members and kick-started their uh, security sector reform efforts and then were handed over to the EU. So it's sort of an interesting parallel to how we might 
look at what's happening in Afghanistan as well. Uh, and the third lens I would suggest is then to look at the sort of achievements uh, and impact the EU had on a particular conflict or theater of operations. So, so this is how I'll structure my, my remarks. So internally, um, well, first of all, also a quick, quick remark on security sector reform in general and security sector reform in Afghanistan in particular. I think we, we, we should be a little bit careful about uh, what, what we mean by security sector reform because, I mean, originally I think it's a, it's a holistic concept. I mean, also looking at oversight and, of course, the security sector is more than just the police or the army. Um, so, but often EU mission or other missions focus on, on one sector in particular and we're quick to you know, call that security sector reform but really we're just looking at one, one aspect of it. Uh, in, in Afghanistan, uh, I think specifically the security sector reform has been made very difficult for, for all actors involved, not just on the sort of missing governance dimension but also because security sector reform back in 2002 was uh, fragmented institutionally with the lead nation model. You know, where the U.S. took on army reform, Germany police, Italy justice, uh, Japan DDR, and the U.K. Uh, narcotics. And, of course, not all lead nations extended the same sort of resources to their individual sectors. Uh, I mean, I'll save myself the jokes on certain <laughs> certain, certain countries. But, uh, but so you see that when, when efforts were made to actually bring these different sectors together, we were looking at very, very different starting points in an escalating conflict situation that suddenly put a much larger emphasis on security rather than uh, merely institution building. So that's a, as a bit of a, a background on, on, uh, on Afghanistan and where the EU came in just to, to, to be a, a bit fair. Now, the EU, as Alex has, has outlined, is, you know, a sum of several parts, uh, which have now sort of, there's been an attempt to merge them through the Lisbon Treaty, but basically in Afghanistan and elsewhere, you have the European Commission, which is mainly the financial arm of EU assistance, development, um, development assistance, underwriting certain crisis management operation, uh, for example, paying police uh, and justice salaries, etc., and then also an operational component uh, through UPOL Afghanistan in the case uh, of Afghanistan, but we've also heard uh, from, from Congo. Now, it's interesting to note the improvements through the Lisbon Treaty because up until earlier this year, you actually had three EU offices in Kabul. Um, the EU police mission, uh, which is housed next to the German police project office, so there you have this sort of member states' coherence point that, that Hans made, which hasn't quite been sorted out. But then there was also a commission delegation and the office of the EU special representative. So basically three addresses for Afghan interlocutors to, to talk to. Clearly not, not, not very coherent, not very consolidated, uh, but as a result of the Lisbon Treaty, at least the commission and the EU special representative office have been merged uh, in, in one location and under one sort of line of command up to uh, Catherine Ashton, and I think that sort of helped consolidate the EU's presence in the field. Where there's still work to be done is on the link between the field where things, as usual, you know, get sorted out because they have to, uh, and, and the masters in Brussels, but also the interaction with other uh, interlocutors elsewhere. And there you have, uh, when it comes to UPOL Afghanistan, the challenge that uh, the head of mission answers to the um, civilian planning and conduct capability in Brussels, who, who answers to the political and security committee, the, the, the ambassadors, who exercise strategic controls. Now, the political arm of the EU, the EU special representative, who is now also the head of delegation, in the mandate is supposed to give political guidance, but he's not really in the chain of command. So you have in Brussels a sort of bureaucratic competition of who's speaking for whom and who can impact mandate, uh, mission activities, uh, etc. And that continues to be um, a bit of a challenge, even though there are now only two people in Kabul delivering uh, political and operational messages, and that's the head of mission of UPOL and the EU special representative. So in that sense, uh, we've seen a slight improvement. Where we've not seen a large improvement is the, the perennial issue of getting uh, staff, boots, uh, policemen, uh, on the ground. I mean, when UPOL was founded uh, in 2007, um, member states were quick to realize that 
the mission ought to be a little bit bigger than, than initially planned for and um, committed to 400 uh, policemen. Uh, but in reality, we're still just under 300, and that's, you know, three years after the launch of the mission, so that's not such a, um, a success story, uh, really, even though um, I would argue the mission has become a lot more targeted than it was uh, in the beginning. I think from, uh, but that's an inherent problem with EU missions. I mean, when member states promise a certain number of, of, uh, of staff and personnel, you know, there's no penalties if they don't deliver them. And it makes it difficult to plan for a mission if you think you're getting 400. You know, obviously you're sort of planning for different activities and programs than, uh, you know, not knowing that actually what you're getting is, is 200 and then sort of 50 extra ones trickling in um, over time. So, th so, th so that's still a real challenge. And I think as the previous speaker noted, if, if at the same time the EU is launching a mission in Kosovo, then, you know, if you have a chance as a police officer, whether you're going to the Balkans where you can fly home, for the weekends or whether you're actually going to Afghanistan where where things are not so safe, then um, it's sort of a no-brainer for many. So we, we've had a real staffing issue there, um, which which UPOL is still, still trying to um, to address. Now, on the, the transatlantic EU-NATO relationship and EU-US relationship, I think we've also seen some improvements, but there have been also significant challenges. Uh, one, um, because of the institutional blockage in the EU-NATO relationship, uh, the Berlin Plus Agreement is only relevant for military operation. Uh, in the absence of a formal agreement, UPOL actually couldn't deploy in the regions or in the individual PRTs, provincial reconstruction teams, without bilateral agreements with the individual lead nations. So for a long time, uh, UPOL staff was sort of stuck in Kabul uh, rather than being able to, to go out in the provinces. It's now been able to do that, not uniformly, um, but, but just, just as an illustration for how, how sort of a missing EU-NATO agreement just slowed down um, uh, the mission uh, overall. And in terms of the EU and the U.S. <coughs> cooperation, I think what's interesting with UPOL Afghanistan, and I don't think that's necessarily the case with other missions, is that UPOL Afghanistan came about in no small part due to U.S. pressures or suggestions for the EU to use its crisis management tools in Afghanistan. So that's different from the Balkans where the EU internally felt the need to do something. In Afghanistan, you have a sort of different scenarios. Um, so, but despite this sort of U.S. Uh, pressure, once the mission was launched, um, the, I think there was a sense of... Uh, um, yeah, well, disappointment and perhaps also annoyance that the EU couldn't do more, couldn't uh, launch a bigger mission, and wasn't really interested in doing the sort of security-relevant uh, training that the U.S. at that time had already um, adopted. And, of course, don't forget that there was sort of a huge um, resource gap between EU uh, and, and U.S. commitments to police reform. So, so apart from the sort of focus on basic training on the part of the U.S. and the sort of focus on uh, mid- and high-level reform and sort of uh, reform of the Minister Interior, you also had uh, a significant dis discrepancy in the sort of money the U.S. and the EU um, had to spend. Now that, again, over the course of three years, I think we've seen a real change in, in attitude and an in increasing mutual understanding of what the EU is and is not capable of. And on the part of the U.S., you know, why what the EU is doing nevertheless provides value added. Um, so over the past three years, you had a sort of, uh, you know, in meetings I've had in Kabul, but also Brussels, sort of m misunderstanding a bit sort of uh, an attitude that, I mean, why aren't they doing more and why aren't they not doing what we think is important to a sort of realization that the sort of long-term civilian approach that the EU has adopted that goes beyond the life cycle of the con conflict itself, but sort of hopes to build sustainable policing arrangements, transparency uh, in the ministries is actually on its own, in itself, um, a, good, a good thing. Meanwhile, also UPOL has adjusted its operational mandate to include uh, civilian training, which initially wasn't, wasn't really the case. So you've, you see a sort of convergent uh, in approaches or sort of a, a more of an effort to sort of fit UPOL into the, the broader uh, EU and, and NATO efforts. 
going back to the sort of internal cohesion issue and, and, and the money again, so the different operating budgets, um, because the commission is the one that pays for all of this, I mean, civilian missions are paid out of the police budgets, uh, the commission budget, sorry, uh, UPOL doesn't actually have its own operating mandate uh, budget that's, that stays with the commission. So you also have a situation where UPOL on its own as a mission doesn't have much to offer by way of, you know, inducing uh, their local counterparts uh, to behave a certain way or not. So this, this issue of conditionality that we mentioned uh, beforehand comes into play there as well. But the commission, again, is making efforts to to make money available uh, for for the mission as well in order for, for UPOL to have a sort of operating budget as well. Um, so, so that's for the for the transatlantic dimension, which I would argue again it's is is getting better. I think expectations have been adjusted to what the respective partners can actually be doing together, jointly, separately. Um, but when we come to the achievement of the mission itself, um, um, yeah, okay. Well, we everyone reads the paper; it's not not looking terribly good. Uh, but I think. This is something that came up in the previous two presentations as well. I mean, the, the approach the EU takes, it's, with the exception of Kosovo, which has a, an executive or partly executive mandate, EU missions are monitoring, mentoring, and advising missions. I mean, personnel is not there to actually make the arrests themselves or force government to adopt a certain uh, way of doing things. So UPOL, like every other EU mission, is dependent on the host government to actually move reforms forward. And I think that's also one of the positive aspects of how UPOL has developed uh, because the, the last Afghan Minister of the Interior actually made, made a, a plan or sort of outline of what he wanted UPOL to accomplish, which helped the mission in term uh, sort of adjust its mandate and, and the focus of its work accordingly. So, but again, but without that counterpart in the ministry, you know, you can launch a mission worth 2,000 people. If the advice doesn't stick, then uh, you, you're sort of not going to get very far. Um, so, so because that relationship has has improved between the ministry uh, and you, Paul, I think we, we can look at sort of uh, more achievements. A better achievements uh, and, and, a, and a more positive um, bottom line. I think this increasingly constructive transatlantic relationship is also an achievement, or you could count it as an achievement. And I think here also uh, individual personalities have gone some way to to, to move UPOL and the U.S. mission and NATO mission closer together. I mean, initially you had re really weak leadership on the part of UPOL lack of understanding on the part of the U.S. and NATO, and that's sort of also because of the sort of people that were on the ground um, got, got fixed a little bit. Um, and just to, to conclude, I mean, I don't think we should measure UPOL against the state of the Afghan security sector uh, on the whole. I mean, there's much to be done that UPOL on its own, I mean, it would really be unrealistic to expect to expect it to, to do that. Uh, but if you just look at the sort of smaller instances of the individual ministries, the focus on the link between police and justice reform, um, but also the sort of long-term civilian training, I think we, sh we ought to give UPOL some credit, mm -hmm. despite all the, um, the, the criticism that, that was rightfully made. And as an extension, I think also EU civilian crisis management as a whole, because I think Afghanistan sort of signifies the most well, one of the most challenging missions the EU has engaged in, both in terms of international interactions and also the conflict cycle. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I want to express appreciation to the panel for three really excellent presentations, uh, great analysis, um, considerable honesty, and some provocative thoughts. Um, I want to invite uh, the audience now to uh, to raise questions. We have microphones on either side. Uh, I'd ask uh, those of you that want to raise questions to come to the microphones. Uh, when you get there uh, and you ask your question, please identify yourself by name and agency. All this is being done because all of this is being recorded and uh, folks watching on the internet want to hear what you have to say. 
uh, in the, uh, while people are moving to the microphones, I want to ask a question. Uh, I want to uh, continue this debate that was going on earlier uh, between Anne-Marie Slaughter and uh, Hans, uh, with Anne-Marie arguing the conventional wisdom um, that she said her husband came up with, which was that the U.S. does the best job with the military and the EU does the best job on the civilian side. And Hans was arguing that, uh, and ain't necessarily so. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Hans to lead and then ask the two other panelists to comment on whether or not the EU, in fact, does have a clear advantage on the civilian side or whether the U.S. you know, might not have some um, strengths that aren't uh, immediately obvious. So let's see. Start with you. Okay, thank you. Um, hmm. Uh, actually, what I reacted strongly on was that the U.S. is a military power and the EU a civilian power. And I said the EU is civilian, yes, but the power, that's something else. Um, <laughs> um, and we are certainly not a military power, that I also want to make clear. Um, <laughs> No, the, the EU likes to sell itself and, and likes to see itself. It's important for our self-image uh, as an institution, and it is the mainstay of the EU's capabilities to have to build civilian capabil capabilities in post-conflict reconstruction and crisis management. But still, as is clear, I think also from Eva's presentation, mine, and then that of, of, of Alex, the, 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 but I'll let them, of course, speak for themselves, but the road ahead is still very long. Um, are we moving forward in, in a certain way? Yes. Um, and the U European External Action Service should in turn provide better coherence, better coordination, but we should have willingness of the key member states to really engage in working under the European flag and stop uh, playing a role or small nitty-gritty politics uh, in those countries or those areas that we consider of interest. Um, if ever the EU wants to be a political actor to which the Congolese governments and the Afghan government and other governments in the world are going to, to listen to advice and we're going to have some influence, then we have to work together. Um, uh, that's also one of the lessons of the, uh, of the financial and other crises. But you see that the EU is, at this point is, is having a serious problem of, 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 of yeah, finding, it, finding its identity, finding its, its place in the world as, as a political union. Um, and, and that's something that's going to take uh, at least another decade to, to settle. Um, so no, yep, more civilian than military, absolutely, but a power, uh, it certainly is not. Um, it should become once, I hope. Eva, what's your view? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think I'm going to take a slightly different approach. I think it, it's not per se that the U.S. is a military power and we're just better at civilian reconstruction or crisis management or security sector reform, whatever you want to call it. It's just we've done it longer. I mean, we have by now, if you just look at CSDP, a 10-year track record of of, uh, of doing these sort of missions with all the uh, warts and all, uh, but we, we can look at a sort of a key of, of what needs to be done. What I find interesting looking at what the uh, – yeah, okay, but we are – what we're missing, the missing dimension that, that – that we don't have to deal with is the role of the military either as an interfering agency or a condoning agency or blocking agency or whatever. Uh, and and we, we don't also have the, the role of Congress that may or may not uh, fund activities. So the EU, in a way, is in a better position to, to decide on these things because we, we know what budget we have and, and uh, that there's less of a sort of overlay on the part of, of the military in the, in the case of the, the United States. So I don't... I wouldn't see it as starkly. Uh, what I find really interesting looking at the U.S. side of things and your efforts to sort of build civilian uh, capabilities is that, you know, the issues you're running into are very similar to what, what we, we've been facing and what we are still facing, uh, and that's finding the right personnel, training it, uh, deploying it in time to the right, to the right uh, missions, paying for them, um, getting bureaucracies to release that staff so that they can go abroad. So I think that we'll, we'll probably see a lot, a lot of similarities in, in once, once your efforts get, get underway a bit more. But I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, the sort of Mars-Venus uh, dichotomy uh, necessarily 
holds here because I mean I think what we've also heard this morning is the sort of threats that we're facing are increasingly calling for civilian responses with the military playing an, an auxiliary role but you know we need development and, and civilian capabilities more so than the military Okay, thanks very much. I'll, I'll ask you to ask your question, and then we'll ask uh, Alex, who knows everything about everything, to respond to both. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello, I'm Elaine Sereo. I'm a Franklin Fellow at the Department of State. And uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I, I actually have a question that relates directly just to some of what you were just answering, but, it's, but I'd like a little more specifics. Everyone has already spoken about the, the uh, dynamics of the EU, they're being able to res- uh, a very rich, ex- as you said, uh, Mr. Uh, Hobeck, a uh, very rich experience, and yet uh, there is very little co- cohesion and coordination, and it's not, it's not for lack of the experience, it's just for lack of pulling it all together so that you can have an effective result for all the efforts that are being made and the expense for that's being made. You know, we will, we, it's no denying that everyone is putting forth a lot. The question is, are you getting the results for your efforts? And how do you seek in a very concrete way some very specifics of what can be done besides saying, well, they need to coordinate better. <laughs> we recognize that. What, what specifically could be done to accomplish the coordination? Are there specific guidelines? Do you have any specific thoughts? And that would be for everyone, really, on how to accomplish it. In other words, what would be the action plan for getting it done versus saying it needs to be done? Thank you. Thank you. Alex, you start. Sure. Um, just, I, I think, you know, I think you started off by summarizing kind of the, the, the mixed picture in terms of Bob's first question between what the EU's advantages and, and sort of challenges are, that you do have this, this real diversity of experience that the EU has done, has put a lot in place in terms of being able to mobilize civilian capacity and done it. Um, but you do have these problems in that it's 27 different countries and, and the decision-making process is, is complex and you've got different institutions and they're still working through um, how to do that. I mean, the, the U.S. actually has, an, has a real advantage here in that the U.S. does have a more cohesive kind of um, political system and still still some challenges that, that um, we heard about this morning, but you do have a chief of mission that can kind of play the political part, whereas the EU is still struggling between these different countries. Um, so... You know, so so how do you try to deal with it on on the EU side? The, the Lisbon Treaty and it has a number of, of very specific provisions. Actually, is is really a lot of it is really focused on on that specific issue. Mm-hmm. It creates the exter- external action service that brings together um, people from both the Council and from the Commission. Um, it calls for for more coordination um, on the planning and, and deployment of the missions. Um, one of the interesting innovations is, is that it creates a the the, the um, EU ambassador position, who is now the sort of com- supposed to be, I think, the combined head of delegation, um, would be nominated from a member state, which would kind of uh, increase the, the, their ability to sort of bring the member states' relationships to bear um, on, on, the, on the relationship with the country. So there are a, n- a number of innovations there. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the bottom line is that the um, – the key is is to really integrate these two structures together, the council and the commission, um, at the planning, at the deployment, um, at the reporting s- stage, um, and and create more unified chains of command. And I think that's been the real real challenge is that you have these two different structures, and how do you bring them together? That's what um, the um, that's what they're grappling right now with the Lisbon Treaty. And then the second piece is is on the grounds. And on the ground, there's a number of things you can do, including trying to have a unified chain of command at the field level, which is exactly what the U.S. is trying to do with bringing everything under the, the chief of mission authority. Um, but there's also lots of more, you know, really kind of nitty-gritty things like, you know, coming up with, with strategies and benchmarks and um, uh, evaluation mechanisms and all those things that really go into the at, at the detailed level, but I would argue are, are critical. So there, there, I think there are a bunch of different levels here. Let's take a question over here, and then Hans can reply to everything that's been said. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Lawrence Smallman, uh, Rand. Uh, Part of me wants to respond to the idea of America as a military power and Europe as a civilian power. um, (laughs) Your accent's giving you away. (laughs) 
Well, perhaps it doesn't, actually, because um, let's be provocative then. Um, to what extent do the liberal sensitivities of Europe affect its ability to be effective in, for example, Africa? And, of course, what I'm talking about are the post-imperial guilt complexes and aspirations for mirror image societies around the world that we wish to aspire to equality for women in Afghanistan or anywhere else whilst they're all being killed because there's a counterinsurgency. So what's mm -hmm. hampering the EU or is there a better way of doing something? Okay. Thanks very much. Good question. Hans. Oh, thank you very much for this. <laughs> <laughs> you asked for it. <laughs> Time for lunch? No, no. <laughs> Five minutes. Um, let, let me start with the first, and I think they're, they're both basically the same. The same answer as, as, as regards the EU. The, the main question is a strategic and political question. Does the EU, as a political and strategic entity, exist? Is there an EU interest in the world? In, in, in a certain sense, yes, but in a practical sense, no. Um, how should we enhance it? Well, it is a very, very long process. In the Cold War, it was easy. We had Western Europe, and there was the Soviet Union, and blah, blah, so we had to stick together. Now we have Eastern Europe, and we still, for example, are not capable as an EU to define a position towards Turkey. Should Turkey become a member of the EU or not? Uh, basically, we decided not, uh, or the French decided not. Um, and so it's not going to happen. So we, we are not even able to establish a strategic position uh, to our closest neighbors. The same goes with uh, Russia. We have this kind of a strategic uh, dialogue or what have you, strategic partnership. Uh, again, there's a few partnership and not very, uh, not very much of strategy in all of it. Um, and with Africa, it's the same thing. We have a very complex relationship with Africa. Um, in which a number of Afri European member states have um, direct engagements. Uh, the others are not at all interested. They know it's this continent where you have a lot of immigrants and we have to stop the immigrants, so let's reinforce the borders uh, and, and, and protect ourselves. Um, but there's no real strategic vision, and you just have to look at the outcome of the EU-Africa summit uh, of, of a few weeks ago. There were six heads of government of the EU, uh, present. Uh, there were about half of the uh, African heads of state uh, present, which is less than you had on the Franco-African summit in Nice uh, a year ago. Um, so there is relatively little investment in this. Uh, there is uh, little vision in this. Uh, and again, very little strategy, in large part because we are internally in Europe um, finding commonalities, finding a vision, finding why this Europe has to be this force in the world. At least that's my personal view. And the, the financial crisis underscored these issues very, very clearly. Uh, look at the cohesion of the euro and the messages that were given to, to member states that had serious uh, financial problems. Um, the first reaction was, let's kick them out of the euro which, of course, worsened the problems uh, in the countries in question considerably. So even if, if, if on those issues we cannot find the, the cohesion that we need, uh, how should we do it on, on, on other issues? Um, now, be to become a bit more technical, uh, I think the, the fact that uh, Commission and Council at least will have one person in charge at uh, country level uh, with an EU ambassador, uh, basically, um, might help. The fact that uh, the rotating presidencies at the field, so in that country level, will, will stop and this will be a permanent presidency by the EU ambassador will help as well to, to, to reinforce some cohesion and some dynamic um, at, uh, at, at, at the national level. Um, but it will depend very much on the strategic direction and cohesion that comes out of Brussels if we're going to do something with this. Uh, and for the moment, this is very very hap haphazard. Uh, that there, there's no no real driver uh, behind this um, at the point at this point. So again, I'm, I'm not really an optimist. I might be a bit cynical at that some stage on this. But okay. Thanks. Thank I think you. we'll take a question and then we'll let Eva respond to everything. 
Um, hi, my name is Jonathan Morgenstein, and I'm with the Department of Defense. And uh, to some degree, you actually were just touching on this. Uh, in describing, I, I forget which ones of you mentioned, previous missions um, involved in Guinea-Bissau, Congo, Somalia, uh, and I, I, my question was how much of an assessment process uh, has did these decisions go through uh, before the decisions were made in the context of considering what would be the impact in the long term of of sending these missions uh, in terms of kind of shoring up the rule of law, human rights, and all those concerns in these countries. And considering uh, it sounded to me like you were just kind of saying not much or not much kind of long-term coherent and strategic considerations uh, and understanding that you've been talking mostly about the EU as an institution, um, maybe another question would be in terms of some of the other major states individually in Europe, uh, what kind of processes, you, if you could speak to that, that they've gone through in similar just national efforts. Uh, and just in case you're inclined to, I, I understand Afghanistan is a completely different issue. So my, my question is more related to, to kind of Africa and, and countries other than Afghanistan because obviously unique circumstances. Thanks. I want to just build on what you said. I, I don't really think we can exclude Afghanistan. I was part of a U.S.-EU dialogue for a year on Afghanistan, and we met in Brussels uh, where the food is really much better than <laughs> other places in the world, and the Americans sat on one side of the table and the Europeans sat on the other, and the Europeans said, we were in Afghanistan because of Article, you know, such as the NATO, NATO Treaty, and we're there because we're good allies of yours. And we said, no, you, you should be there because of all these intrinsic reasons why we're there. And they said, no, no, you don't understand. We're there because we're Article 5 of it, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll start with Eva. You take uh, it back I to Afghanistan. Okay, I won't talk about Afghanistan for the last question, I promise. Um, but I think this assessment process and long-term impact is, is interesting. It also goes back to this short-term crisis intervention versus long-term structural uh, change of the CSDP mission, which, I, you know, if you look at the missions, actually most of them are long-term, uh, geared towards long-term structural change, and, you know, it's sort of, I think, crisis mission is perhaps a bit of a, a misnomer. Uh, you know, the, the capabilities for sort of lessons learned and sort of assessments across the missions is, is still in construction. I think so far we've sort of done one and then, you know, did the other, but without sort of, sort of much... Uh, you know, much much handover or continuity, and I think the only end state the, I can really think of in terms of strategic goals for missions is in the Balkans, where its membership. You know how we transition from the crisis mission to commission <coughs> to membership, like we did in in, in Macedonia, um, is now an open question, given that we have two hard cases left: Bosnia and Kosovo. One's not a whole state, and the other one sort of. Deadlocked. So, we, so there's a, a broader political question there. But I wanted to come back to the what, what, what to do. Um, your question, and I think there's sort of a bottom-up and top-down approach that would have to take place uh, jointly for 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 things to shift a little bit. I mean, bottom-up, we could think of uh, you know developing common common training standards, making sure that there is a sort of European model of crisis missions, civilian reconstruction, that's actually in the works, but much more needs to be done to really make 20, you know, seven member states, police and justice and whatever staff, merge them into sort of a European uh, structure. Joint planning, I think, is important, sort of merging the sort of threat assessment, intelligence sharing, uh, you know, all that sort of pre-mission stuff um, together would, I think, create a sort of cohesion, a socialization also to, to make a EU coherence more more likely. And then on the top, of course, the Lisbon changes uh, hopefully will, once the system's up and running, which probably will take another, well, well, the QDDR wasn't released right away. Either, so, you know. <laughs> so yeah, another year perhaps um, um, should, should sort of bring cohesion between the financial and the political arm of the EU, just because Catherine Ashton is double-headed as Secretary General, head representative, but also Vice President of the Commission with the uh, foreign portfolio. So you think hopefully, some of that could be driven by the current, literally economic situation. Uh, right now, with, with everyone so focused yeah. on the 
economic yeah. situation, everyone's going to have to start to say, how are we going to make this all about the uh, you know, you know, it's instead of everybody yeah. running in different directions and money being spent. No, I think I think the two possible the two possible outcomes. I think the changes we see now, you know, Ashton's post and also these sort of uh, bottom up things are uh, arise out of the perceived need for more coherence and also on the part of member states for a wish for the EU to play a bigger role in the world. I mean, all the negative comments aside, I think that's what all. EU member states in principle can agree on. Now, how the financial crisis will come in is an interesting question because at the same time, as you said, we we see uh, increasing lack of solidarity. Um, so, and whether the financial crisis will lead to more sort of common action or whether it'll mean that everybody is sort of protecting their own turf uh, and how that will trickle down or up or sideways to, to foreign policy remains to be seen. But I think at the mo- I, th- I wouldn't conflate the two for now. I think the financial crisis may or may not, not have a positive effect on, on the EU's cohesion. I mean, the way it looks right now, it's, uh, I wouldn't be too hopeful because just the political discourse is getting uh, points in the other direction. But perhaps what's happening on, on the ministerial levels uh, might, might be different. On the guilt complex and what the EU, what's happening in the EU, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, it's on the military Dimension, you know, it's 27 member states with different strategic cultures, and you know, only two of them actually like to send their military forces abroad, uh, and that hasn't really changed significantly since over the past decades in these crisis missions. But I think, and, and I think that'll remain that way. I mean, I think, I, you know, I'm not delusional enough to think that that the EU could merge over overnight into a military power or power that's as comfortable with sending troops abroad as, as the U.S. is. But I think it's also a fair question to ask what, it, what is it we actually want to do? I mean, you know, an intervention in Afghanistan the way you, well, you, not you, but the U.S. has, uh, has uh, committed to, or are we looking at sort of short-term operation the way our military operations so far have been? So I think uh, the purpose question has to be asked as well. Thank you. From where I'm sitting, I'm watching the rooftops across the street fill up with snow. So um, uh, if it's all right with everybody, let's do the following. Uh, We'll take the two questions from the the people who are standing. Uh, We'll ask the panel to respond um, to everything that's been said and make closing remarks, and then um, we'll call it a day. So uh, we'll start over here. Hi, I'm Victoria Stadel, Lieutenant Commander of the United States Navy. I just got back from Afghanistan a couple months ago, and I really have a very quick more comment mm-hmm. um, in the sense that I want to tell you that I worked with UPOL extremely closely, and mm-hmm. they were fantastic. And I know that um, it's it can be easily seen as a pessimistic bit, and coming from the NATO training mission, I can most certainly make a lot of criticisms about our own institution from being on the inside. But from an outsider looking in, working with UPOL, you bring um, – expertise that we just don't have. Mm-hmm. And once egos are able to be put aside on the table on both sides, I think we can really get a lot of work done. And what you pull brings that we as um, the U.S. military force and also a NATO force is that the long-term vision of you pull. And uh, it was a little bit challenging, of course, at times to deal with different timelines, mm-hmm. but the Command and Staff College and other programs that are going on in Afghanistan would absolutely have not have happened if it wasn't for you pull. And in truth, I, <laughs> I think a real issue is that they're literally across the t- side, other side of town, yeah. and that's an issue because we, as far as Hans mentioned with risk aversion, is as a military, mm. there's an issue of just getting across town yeah. as, as frequently as I wish we were in, in order for us to work more coherently. Mm. But they were fantastic, and uh, we're doing a lot more than we ever could in, in Afghanistan because of you, Paul. So good response. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. Please. Uh, Jeff Stacy from the State Department, and just echo uh, the the U.S. humility, and, and, and uh, <laughs> which Bob you started us with, um, and the candor of this panel is just really, really welcome and, and, and impressive. And um, I work at, at SCRS, as you heard in the last thing with the QDR. It's going to be this new bureau on crisis stabilization operations, and hopefully a new mandate. And we're young in this, this field and just getting going. So CSDP is. As Eva said, has been going on a much much longer. But you know, the UN has been doing this mostly from a peacekeeping perspective, but not entirely. A lot longer than, even than the EU, and none of us have figured out how to do this really well. DDR, which SSR is really um, 
overlaps with DDR. These things are so incredibly difficult. No one that I'm aware of anywhere has figured out how to do this effectively. There's not a single shining program that mm -hmm. an NGO or a government or an international organization can point to and say, this is how to do this. So we're all desperate for answers. One thing that um, we're trying, and it'd be great to see individual experts um, and think tanks um, talk, talk more about and, and sort of point the way forward in your own perspectives is this new International Stabilization and Peace Building Initiative, ISPI or ISPI, um, basically is an effort to get all the civilian players, governments and international organizations together to work initially on lessons learned, training and roster recruitment and management, but eventually planning logistics mm -hmm. and field coordination. Ultimately, the goal is to learn how to become field interoperable. And yet it's, it's governments and all the politics and personalities are involved and it's, it takes a long time to get this going. We could use pointers, suggestions. Um, one thing that we're wondering about is, um, is, is perhaps uh, something that we haven't tried yet. Do we grab the experts in terms of the different sectors of local capacity building, transition to local ownership? We all want the same things. Do we find our top experts in UNDP, um, in CSDP, um, whatever agency you just govern, bring them together, lock them in a room until they don't come out? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely joking. <laughs> We're looking for answers, so anything you have for us would be great. Thanks very much. Let's go um, have the panel present in the original order. We'll have Hans. Well, actually, let's, mm -hmm. do you want to start first? Or you want to start first? No. Sure. All right, you start, then we'll go down. Okay. Um, just, I wanted to make one comment picking up on some of the earlier discussion and then, and then react to the last question, which I think is a good good sort of way to end and then sort of continue the, the rest of the conversation. Um, and the, the first point is that the, and, and the, the, this issue of coordination and, and the identity of the EU and different member states, I mean, the, the fact that you've got all these different member states makes it difficult to get on the same page. On the other hand, it is one of the advantages of the EU is that you have um, France, the UK, Germany, other states that have very strong bilateral relationships with certain countries. And when they're able to use that effectively, it, it it could have a, a real political impact. I think it's interesting that the, in the Lisbon Treaty, they've decided to have EU ambassadors from member states to really build on those relationships. And I think one of the questions um, is, is how to figure out you know, what role the, the EU institutions play, not only in terms of building um, their own capacity, but in terms of facilitating um, the strengths and weaknesses of the, of, of the member states. Um, and I think building on that, there's there, there's a lot of room there for greater cooperation across the Atlantic with the U.S. because you know the U.S. can can also bring its strengths and weaknesses to bear and figure out where we complement each other, both on the level of individual member states and um, uh, relative to the U.S. Um, I'm you know interested to hear about the International Stabilization and Peace Building Initiative. I think those are the kinds of things that we really advocate for. Um, Eva mentioned things like developing common tra training standards and common concepts. I mean, those are the things that I think we really need to, to start hashing out. There's, there's been so much of this getting out to the field and people just rely on what they know um, and, and the, the result is ad hoc. But there's a real opportunity, I think, now um, as we start gr to grapple with, okay, what are the standards, what are the directions, what are the, the training that we need? Um, for um, people from, from, from the U.S., from different member states, from the EU to start hashing these things out, common training standards, common concepts for, for what kind of work to do, um, uh, actual ways to processes for doing strategic planning, for, for working on, on governance, um, common indicators and measurement tools and so forth. Um, and there's a lot of knowledge out there and experience, and I think those are the kinds of things that, that experts in, in that kind of forum should be, should be working on. Um, and, and again, drawing from the different strengths, not only of the EU as an institution, but uh, the member states in the U.S. and figuring out how to, how to bring all that together. So I think there's a, there's a, a rich and um, um, difficult agenda ahead, but hopefully this, um, it, we're going in that direction. Thanks, Hans. Thank you. Um, to, to, to build on, on, on Alex's points, uh, to which I agree 100%, um, initi initiatives like ISPI and others should also um, reinforce uh, w what we all know, but what we can't sell politically is that this is 
incredibly complicated and that this takes huge amounts of time and resources, but especially time. Mm. Um, if, if you have to present results in two years' time or in three years' time in processes that will take 10, 15 years and in which you will have setbacks and in which you will... But you need from the initial uh, uh, concept of when you plan an operation or when you plan a program, you, you need to calculate all those uh, drawbacks and, and, and small returns of, of, of fortune and so forth in, <coughs> in, in, your, in your initial plan, which for the moment is, is almost impossible to do because, again, you have to deliver within... For the EU, it's, it, it has at a certain point been six months for, for you, Paul. What, what can you do in six months? You can fly in people and then uh, they're already packing their bags to, to get out. So you, you, you need, through these initiatives and through <coughs> better collaboration at the international level, to build enough of a consensus that you need this long-term investment and you, that you make it politically viable for governments and for um, international institutions to get on board of those um, although I think this is almost a mission impossible. Um, but the EU and, and I, what, what you said about Afghanistan, yes, uh, it's, it's in Congo, it's true as well. The EU and, and, and the US, we have huge human capabilities to, to act in the field, and great people are out there doing uh, their work, and sadly we, we have some political issues left and right. Um, but they make uh, interesting programs and projects possible. Um, and I want to, to add one thing on, on what Eva said, um, the unity of action in, in the Balkans. At a certain point, there was a unity of action in the Great Lakes as well. Um, we had four missions building on each other, and combined with that, a huge investment by the European Commission in, in, in Congo for the elections in 2006. Sadly, it all evaporated um, in 2007. And now we're going to probably make the same mistake again by pumping hundreds of millions of uh, euros in a new electoral phase that is not going to have the slightest impact whatsoever for the Congolese. Um, and how to deal with this kind of situations, how to work with those governments to be more responsive to civilian protection and to, uh, to at least some form of progress, that is what we're all having to deal with, I think. Um, so I wouldn't mind to be locked in the room for... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Eva, okay. last but not least. Okay. Well, thanks for, for those uh, final two comments. And I think, um, you know, I mean, having having worked on this for for so long, I mean, I'm, I think <coughs> one of the most positive aspects of these conversations today, but also over the past six months, is that this sort of sense of... Uh, Competition and mutual exclusivity of, of transatlantic, but also U.S. OSCE EU efforts has sort of given way to a more pragmatic uh, approach, and that means who can do what we, what needs to be done and how do we do it? And I think um, that that makes that at least for me is is a is a is a really positive positive thing. I mean, what what you just said on you, Paul. I mean, I think it shows how. And I think the sort of dismissive attitude at the top sort of trickled down also on the staff level when it's actually not, not necessarily warranted. And I'm glad that th this has disappeared a little bit. And from the EU side, I think when we started our CSDP missions, I mean, our first concern was to, you know, move the OSCE out of the way so that we could, you know, take over governance in the Balkans and, and sort of be anything but the UN. But I think now all the civilian crisis actors are sort of comfortable enough in their identity, let's say, to, to actually start looking at doing things together. So I think Jeffrey's uh, intervention was very yeah, spot on. I hope we'll you know, get to do more of this in the future. I hope that's where it's headed and where it's also going to stay. I mean. Okay, I want to thank the panel for uh, some wonderful presentations and some really interesting comments. Um, as you leave the building, I, I think you'll realize, uh, as the song says, that it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. No. Okay. Uh, I want to wish you all a very happy holiday and uh, ask you to keep an eye on the USIP website. We will have the next meeting of, of the SSR Working Group in February. Cool. So um, with that, thanks a lot. and. Uh,